Welcome to part 4 of the Bare Bones Basic Tutorial for Linux CNC. In this lesson I'm going to be covering the PNC Conf wizard and how it pertains to Ethernet based Mesa hardware. So to get started we'll go to our Applications menu, CNC, and PNC Conf wizard. Inside of there we'll press Start. And the first two options are the same options that we saw in the StepConf wizard. Do we want to create a new configuration or modify a configuration that's already been created with this program? The next two, again, are very similar. Create a desktop shortcut for our file folder and create a desktop launcher for our Linux CNC configuration. The next two options are for, this is for the INI file and the how file that get generated. This option here allows you to set up a, uh, a substitute name for the Mesa card in the INI file instead of having to remember the entire string of what the Mesa card is called in the how file. We won't get into that in this lesson. This is just for basics. But the show advanced option page is important because that allows us to set up some additional functionality that we didn't see in the StepConf wizard. So the next option is a machine name and we'll call this test mill PNC. Under access configuration we have include spindle if we have a spindle that we wish to enable, we would, we would use the include spindle option. Here we have our XYZ, XYZA, and XZ for lathe configurations. Machine units are either inch or metric. The servo period is very much like the jitter test in StepConf wizard, but instead of the base thread, we're looking at the jitter for the servo thread. So we'll run this test. We'll do the GLX gears. Grab it, pull it. Go to our favorite website and see what the jitter is here. And then once that test is done, we can take that value and put it into here. Now this is asking for the actual servo period. It's not asking for the max jitter. So you'll put your max interval number in there instead of the max jitter number that was here. The next options are for whether we want to use a Mesa PCI Ethernet or parallel port card as a Mesa Zero. And if we wanted to add a second one, we can add it as a Mesa One. So this gives us the option of using two Mesa boards, and then from there we can choose if we want to add additional parallel ports. So you can really do a lot of configuring inside of the PNC Conf Wizard with all of that Mesa hardware. The next options are to require homing before using MDI commands or running the machine. If you have home switches, this is a good option to select. If you don't have home switches, you would deselect it. And then anytime you power up your machine, wherever it powers up is where your machine zero point is going to be considered. So just keep that in mind. Here we have a prompt for manual tool change. The leave spindle on during tool change option is for lathes. So if you have a lathe, you don't want to turn the spindle off in between your tools. You just want to back your roughing tool away, switch to your finishing tool, reselect your surface footage for your finishing speed while the spindle's running, and that reduces the start and stop delay time of your spindle. And it's 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 more more suited for cycle time reduction than anything else. The force individual manual homing requires you to press every homing switch 
inside of your configuration, inside of your GUI. So if you select this, instead of hitting the home all button, you would have to select each axis and press the home button for that particular axis. Move spindle up before tool change. We'll just move the spindle up to a position prior to changing the tool out. Usually a uh, homing routine is written into your post processor for your G-code, but this is a, a, this is a nice little option to have. The restore joint position after shutdown. I'm not really sure what that does. The random position tool changer is if you want to set up an ATC magazine and it has a random access type configuration. Uh, random access type configuration is for a side mounted tool changer that has a double arm. So every time a tool comes into position, say we have tool one in the spindle and we bring tool pocket number five around and change from tool number one to the tool that's in pocket five, the tool arm will grab tool number one and the tool in pocket number five simultaneously, change the tool, and after it changes the tool, because it's got the because it's got tool number one in the spindle claw, when it swings around and puts the new tool in, it puts tool number one into pocket number five. And then if you change to a different tool, say you change to a tool that's in pocket number 10, the tool that was originally in pocket number 5 will then be placed into pocket number 10 because of the double arm swing. If you're just getting started, that's a little bit more advanced than you need to worry about right now. So we'll just leave that blank. Inside of the screen options, we've got Axis, we've got TK Linux, Gmo Kapai, and the touchy interface that we can default to inside of here. Again, I like to use Gmo Kapai. The options inside of here don't really matter much at the moment, but here we can set a maximum spindle override a minimum spindle override and a max feed override but the maximum that it will go is 200 percent for both spindle and feed if you wanted to set up overrides that were higher than this value here we would have to modify the ini file the position offset positional feedback and act and display geometry for now we'll just leave these the way they are Inside of the VCP page, we have the option to include custom Pi VCP GUI panels. If we go into that, we have the option of displaying a spindle speed Pi VCP panel that will be automatically generated for us. We can use a blank program, which will just call up a blank window and we can have the uh, the files necessary to create our own PyVCP GUI panel but in this case we'll just leave that unselected underneath here we have the option for creating a, a Glade VCP GUI panel inside of here we can choose a sample display or include a, a custom program that we've already made if we use a sample display and we look at that, again, we'll just have a little spindle speed display, but this is done using Glade VCP rather than Pi VCP. They're a little bit different. Glade VCP is more of a, uh, a WYSIWYG, which is a what you see is what you get interface for creating the uh, virtual control panels. So you would open this up, you'd create a top level, and then from there you can go into 
how components, you can add a button, things like that. Whereas with the PyVCP, you have to code it all out in the form of XML. But again, we'll skip over that for now. Under external controls, this is one of the screens that pops up when we click the advanced option checkbox on the first page. Here's where you can set up a serial VFD, external button jogging, external MPG jogging, external feed override. These are for external controls, buttons and jog wheels and things like that. The one that we want to focus on inside of here, for the most part, is the USB jogging because this is the simplest way to create an external control device to move your machine around. In this case we can use a video game controller, plug it into USB port, create a device rule, and then we can assign buttons to each of the commands that are inside of this box here. So under USB jogging, what we'll want to do is go to add device rule and it'll say disconnect the USB device please so if we have one plugged in we would disconnect it we'll say yes plug the device back in in my case I'm using a PlayStation 3 controller we'll plug it in and if this window comes up and it shows you that there are drivers that got loaded and it says it's adding this specific rule, then we know that we're okay. Then it'll ask you to unplug and plug your device back in again. So you unplug it, plug it back in, hit OK. And then from there we can go to test device. And these are all of the input signals that are generated from our PlayStation controller. So if we click on each of these pins and we start moving the controller around, we'll see right here under this HAL meter that when I move one of the analog sticks for the ABS-RX is neg, I get a true reading whenever I use the negative on one of the analog sticks. If I go down to abs X is neg, it'll be the negative direction of the other analog stick. In my case, I'm looking at the left side analog stick close to the D-pad. So once we get our device connected, we can go in and we can figure out what each of these values pertain to on our controller. So right now I know input.0.abs-x-is-pause is the analog stick pointing to the right and abs-x-is-neg is pointed to the left. So just to show you a quick example, here we can put in input.0.abs-x-is-pause dot zero dot abs dash x dash is dash pause copy that paste it and change it to is neg go back to our test device first we'll double verify that I put this in right input dot zero dot abs dash x dash is neg is pause good so then we can go to our ABS Y position, look at our HAL meter. And we can see that there's an ABS Y is neg and Y is pause. In my case with the analog stick, the is neg is in the up direction and the is pause is in the down direction. So what I want to do is I'll either want to switch the naming conventions so the y minus will be y is pause and the uh, y positive will be y is neg or inside of 
my how file, I can reverse the direction inside of there. So there's a command for that as well. So it depends on how you want to do it. If you want to set it up the easy way, just switch the naming conventions here inside of your y-axis values and you won't have to go into the HAL configurations to change anything there. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll copy and I'll paste and I'll just change the ABS X to Y and I'll copy this one paste change that to Y and now we have it set up so that our analog pointed negative is the positive direction which is pointed up and our input Y is positive is in the Y negative direction which would be down so you would do that for your X, your Y, and your Z. You'd find buttons to use for your Z axis direction. If you had an A axis, you would you could use buttons to set up jogging for the A axis. The speed A and speed B are buttons that you assign to create what's called a MUX command, a multiplexer command. I have a, a lesson on multiplexers in my HAL tutorials, but Let's just say that speed A would be one button, speed B would be another button, and then between the two of them, you can choose four different speeds based on whether you're not pressing either button, pressing button A, pressing button B, or pressing button A and B at the same time. And then if you wanted to use the analog stick for analog control, what you would do is instead of picking the, the, uh, the ABS positions, you would look through your test device to see if there are analog signals that get picked up, and you can put the analog control inside of these as well. So usually if you go to test device and you go to close, a little menu pops up, and it shows you that yeah, you have the option of using X and Y for positive and negative that give you a digital input, a zero or a one, but you also have the option of using the ABS-X-Position callout instead of the ABS-IsNeg and IsPause. You can assign your X-axis to this ABS-X-Position and you can get analog feedback. So the farther you depress your analog stick in any direction, the faster it's going to feed. So the next page that we're going to come across is the Mesa card configuration page. Under board name, we can choose the Mesa card that we have. In my case, I always use the 7i76E, but we also have the option for 7i92s, 7i93s, 7i96, and then some of the 5i series cards for PCI slot. Underneath the firmware version, if there were additional versions of firmware, it would they would pop up underneath the drop-down menu. The card address sets the default card value for the Mesa 7i76E. If you use this address and you want to use a Wi-Fi connection, chances are this IP address assignment will interfere with your Wi-Fi card. So there are two options that we can choose on the Mesa card from standard. If I open this graphic, and if you watch the video of the 7i76 basic overview that I did, if we zoom in close to the Ethernet port, you'll see that we have this little jumper position here for W3. The standard jumper in the down position will give us the 192.168.1.121 IP address designation that we would use inside of this card address option here. If we move this jumper from this position 
use a little screwdriver to pull it out or some tweezers, something like that. Take it out and just move it to where this pin and this pin are being jumped together. That changes the IP address designation to 10.10.10.10. .10 .10 .10. By doing this, it will eliminate any IP address conflicts that we may experience if we're trying to run a Wi-Fi connection alongside our wired connection for the 7i76e. On the other boards, there are also jumpers. They do vary from board to board, so please refer to your proper documentation to make sure that the IP address jumper that you're changing is the proper address. The PWM and PDM base frequencies on this board are not adjustable. The watchdog timeout, we don't really need to mess with. The number of encoders, number of PWM generators, step generators, smart serial ports, number of channels, and total number of pins, we can disregard all of those for right now. This is a basic setup. The standard settings that we have here are generally all we need to get started. But as a side note, if I do lower this number of step generators down from five to four or three, depending on how many step generators I'm going to need for the amount of motors that I have attached to this board, I will get the option of using the step and direction terminals on that particular step generator as 5 volt outputs that I can control within Linux CNC. It's a slightly advanced subject but it is something that we do have the option of doing on the 7i76e. So there are cases where as an example, when we set up the field power of the 7i76e, again, if you watch my overview video of the 7i76 board, you'll kind of understand what I'm trying to explain here. But when I put power to my field power and I put power to the last four pins on the TB3 section here, that gives me 24 volts for my input and output control. There are times where I'm going to need some 5 volt inputs or outputs or something like that. And Mesa does give you a couple of options for 5 volt peripherals that you may not know about when you actually connect this board because when you have 24 volts going through your field power the inputs and outputs want to see a 24 volt load except for the times where you replace a step gen with 5 volt outputs and there are four pins available on the input section of the 7i76 that lend themselves to an A and B pulse for an MPG jog wheel, but they also allow 5 volt sensitivity for 5 volt encoders or something of that nature. So just a small side note, there is available 5 volt IO even though you're running a 24 volt field power through the field I.O. section of this board. So getting back to here, if we leave all of these as standard, aside from changing the card address to 10.10.10.10 to allow us Wi-Fi functionality as well as wired Ethernet, we can go ahead and press the Accept Component Change button down below. Once we do that, it enables four tabs over top here. The I.O. Connector 1 tab is where we set up our step and direction for each of our five axes. 
under number zero, which is step gen one, I can select axis, main axis, X axis. Under step gen one, which is actually number two, go axis, main axis, Y axis. And then here we can go main axis, Z axis. Three and four are unused. And again, if we were to completely disable the usage of these, if I go back just to show you, go back to my configuration page, I'll say number of step gens is four. Press the accept component change button. Go back to here. You'll notice that the screen looks a little bit different because the four step gen is now set to eight and nine with available GPIO outputs. Don't let this fool you. Even though it says input or output, these step gens are strictly five volt output, but they are controllable. So for anything that requires a five volt output, be it a spindle command, coolant command, some type of emergency stop or enable signal, charge pump signal, um, a five volt digital output, you can assign those in this number eight and number nine GPIO. The next option down below here is for the 7i76 mode zero and 7i76 mode two. There's also a mode one, but the mode one is pretty much to just enable analog inputs where mode two enables analog inputs and enables the MPG jog inputs. And what I mean by that is on the 7i76 card, inputs one, two, three, and four are able to be set up as analog inputs instead of digital inputs. So a digital input is an on or an off, or in computer terminology, zero or one, just basic binary. An analog input allows you to use, say, for example, a potentiometer, a linear taper potentiometer, to vary the voltage going to that input from zero to 24 volts and as you turn that potentiometer, you either get closer to zero or you get closer to 24 volt. And by doing that, as you turn that potentiometer, you have the option of setting values inside of Linux CNC via the analog signal. So these are great for using a basic 10K linear taper potentiometer for things like feed rate override, spindle override, rapid traverse override, et cetera, et cetera. The other option that mode two gives you, like I said, is that this pin, this pin, this pin, and this pin, which are labeled on the board as 16, 17, 18, and 19, but because computers, this input here is actually even though I said one, two, three, and four, label-wise, they're labeled zero, one, two, and three. It does get a little confusing. But if we look at it from that perspective, zero, one, two, three, and then up here, 16, 17, 18, and 19. These four be, uh, become enabled as basically MPG inputs. So if I go back to here and I select mode two, you'll see quickly a little thing pop up. But when I go to the 7i76IO page under TB5, if I were to count from TB6, zero to 15, 
which are 0 to 15, and then 16 to 31. If I go here, 0 to 15 on TB6. On TB5, it should say 16, 17, 18, and 19, but instead it shows me two unused encoders. Underneath the unused encoder, I have a spindle encoder option, an MPG jog control option, so I can select an MPG jog wheel that runs on a 5 volt pulse. Or I have an override MPG control that I can use as well. So I can use a feed rate override, spindle override, or a maximum velocity override. But usually, I just use a multi-hand wheel. But on my on my MCO PC Turn 55, I'm actually using this bank of encoder input, which would actually be 18 and 19 pins on the 7i76 as a home pulse and an index pulse, or as they would call it in Linux CNC, the index pulse being the home pulse and a strobe pulse for my turret index. So as it goes from station to station, the strobe will trigger the encoder pulse and then a counter inside of my software will count up for every station that the turret indexes to until it get, gets back to one. And once it gets back to one, the index pulse or the home pulse will send a signal back to Linux CNC and it will re-zero or re-home the turret every time it cycles around one complete revolution to guarantee that it's always referenced on the number one pulse. But I digress. So let's go back to our IO connector, page one. We've set up our X, Y, and Z step gens. We've set our 7i76 to mode two to utilize some analog inputs and MPG inputs. Under the unused channels on the right, we have the option of selecting some additional I.O. boards for the RS-422 section. We also have an option for setting up our spindle encoder if we have one. So if we're using um, a VFD that has a spindle with an encoder, we can use the encoder to supply feedback to Linux CNC to count the RPM or index for rigid tapping or threading. We can also use that encoder input for um, hand wheel input. So we can actually put multiple jog hand wheels on our machine. The 7i76 gives you provisions for basically three MPG encoders. In this case, I'll just tell it that it's a basic spindle encoder. So you'll see right here we have a quadrature, encoder A, B, and encoder I, which is index. And it automatically sets all the options up when we go through this. Under I.O. Connector tab 2, here's where we can set up some uh, GPIO for if we were using the expansion connectors we would use connector two and connector three to set up the GPIO coming from these. But we're not worried about that at the moment. The one thing that we want to focus on will be the 7i76 IO section. TB6, again, if we have the option set to mode number two, the first four inputs that we have here can be assigned as analog inputs. Underneath the 
unused input drop downs we have a bunch of different options that we can select we've got limit switch configurations home switch configurations shared limit and home switch configurations digital inputs that we can assign for any type of general purpose input that may not have a particular label we can set this up with spindle control buttons machine operation buttons cycle start abort single step we can use uh, we can use buttons to select our axes We can use inputs for our e-stop. We can use it for our probe input. We can select jog buttons. We can control uh, brushless DC motors. So there's a lot of configuration ability or configurability in this drop-down menu. From a bare bones perspective, the things that we would focus on most would be a home switch for X, Y, and Z. Perhaps an e-stop button. A probe input for a tool setter. And if we wanted to get fancy, like I said, we could set up a cycle start button, a single block button, and so on and so forth. The way that these are set up on the 7i76, whether it's a 7i76E or a 7i76ED, all of the inputs on the 7i76 series boards are syncing inputs, which means that when I want to set up a button on one of these inputs, I connect one side of the button to 24 volt positive. The 24 volt positive comes into my switch, and then out from the switch, I send the 24 volt to the input pin that I want to designate on the 7i76 board and when I action when I activate that button the button takes in the 24 volt and then passes the rest out to here as a ground or as a common so the 7i76 TB6 and TB5 are just a whole bunch of inputs and then on the far right hand side if we were to fart if we're looking at it this way it's actually these ones on the top but if we look at it rotated 90 degrees they'd be on the far right hand side this section up here we have 16 outputs in banks of eight so we have eight here and eight here that we can set up under these tabs. So TB6 controls outputs 0 through 7. TB5 controls outputs 8 through 15. And we can use these outputs for spindle command, coolant command, some type of enable. So we can send out, if there's, a, if there's some kind of fault, we can send out an e-stop. We could send digital output, so zero or one for on or off. Digital output for something that's not listed inside of here, just some general purpose type configuration. A lot of times the digital outs are used for remapping your tool changer. If you have an ATC on your machine and you would use the digital outputs to command relays for different steps in the sequence of your automatic tool change. And then the analog output, TB4, 
if we set this up as a spindle output, what this does is it enables this spindle board section right here, or the spindle plug section here, for analog spindle control for output to a VFD. If you watch my MCO build, uh, build videos, you'll see that I have some information on setting up the TB4 socket, the first three pins being a ground, a 5 to 10 volt input, and then a varying speed coming out of the center of the two, of the three actually, going to the VFD in the form of basically an analog spindle control. So from zero, and in my case, five volts. So from zero to five volt, I can vary the speed of my lathe spindle with these guys here. So from there, we just hit forward. Under our X motor setting. Basically, what we're doing is we're setting up our driver type inside of here. Much like we did in StepConf Wizard, we have the option of selecting a predetermined drive or setting up a custom drive. The step on time, step space, direction hold, and direction setup are default to 5000 and 10000. But if you choose a different drive, you'll notice that the values do change. So depending on the drive that you have set up, there's going to be a different on time, space time, hold, and direction setup. So if you're using a board that's not, if you're using a stepper driver that's not listed here, and you go to linuxcnc.org and you try to find your particular stepper driver and it's not listed there, you're going to have to play around with these values to get your motors to actually move. I will tell you that right out of the gate. We're not going to worry so much about these values here for the time being. We're just trying to get our board to communicate and then get our stepper drivers to communicate to the board to Linux CNC. And then from there, we can make our fine-tune adjustments and things like that. What we do have to worry about is our stepper scale, our maximum velocity, and our maximum acceleration. Under Calculate Scale, we have a whole bunch of different options that we can use to set up our stepper driver step scales. If we're using stepper motors that are directly coupled to our lead screw or ball screw. We would just use a standard one-to-one -one configuration. In that case, we wouldn't have to enable the pulley or worm turn ratio. But going back to my Gecko G540, if I'm thinking about it from the from the instance of a Gecko G540, I would have to enable micro step, change that to 10. The micro step is going to be the setting that is on your stepper driver. A lot of stepper drivers do have adjustable micro steps, so you can make micro stepping adjustments on the stepper driver via the dip switches, and then you would just put the multiplication factor inside of here. The motor steps per revolution standard stepper motor 200 steps per rev with 10 micro steps gives us 2000 pulses per revolution with our with our drive if we're using metric pitch lead screws we can enable this checkbox here and again the standard ball screws that a lot of users are buying are the 1605, the 1610, the uh, 2005, and the 2010 ball screws. The difference being the 16s are 16 millimeter diameter, the 20s are 20 millimeter diameter, the 5 is a 5 millimeter pitch 
and the 10 is a 10 millimeter pitch. So every revolution of the screw will move the machine either 5 or 10 millimeters depending on the pitch of the lead screw. If you're using inch specification lead screws, you would put the number of threads per inch inside of here and enable that checkbox. But most of the time, people are buying the you know, AliExpress or Alibaba metric screws. So in that case, we would just use a five millimeter pitch. If we were using the CNC router parts or Avid CNC rack and pinion drive setup, the NEMA 23 rack and pinion drive setups are a three to one reduction and the NEMA 34s are, I believe, a 3.2 to one reduction. And in that case, you would just use the pulley teeth and you can do your calculations from there. So we'll see right here that with a 200 step motor, a 10 micro step factor, and a five millimeter per revolution screw without any additional reduction ratios. We have a motor steps per unit of 10,159.9997, which right here will show us our steps per inch, our resol resolution of inches per step, which is pretty fine if you ask me and then some additional information for your max motor RPM at your maximum rapid speed and your pulse rate so you hit apply it just fills in that little stepper scale so if you know how to calculate your stepper scale without having to use that calculate scale button you can just key it in right here actually your maximum velocity in inches per minute is your rapid traverse rate or your maximum jog feed rate that you can set up in your software. In step conf, this is done in inches per second and inside of PNC conf it's done in inches per minute. So we don't have to calculate the inches per second to inches per minute or vice versa as we did in step conf. Here, if I wanted to set up a 200 inch per minute rapid traverse, I would just put in 200. Instead of having to go 200 divided by 60 and put that value into my velocity as inches per second. The maximum acceleration does remain the same. The higher you go with your acceleration, the longer it takes to achieve your maximum rapid traverse rate. A good starting point is about 50 with a five pitch lead screw. 200 inch a minute is usually the going rate for rapid travers with that type of lead screw. The next page is for setting up our home switches and our machine soft limits, just like we did in Step Conf Wizard. So in between clips, I did have a bit of a wardrobe change. I got a new lapel microphone. Um, I was using my Pro Audio setup, and it doesn't really work too well in my living room. So I do apologize if there is a difference in levels or tone. I will try to adjust those in my post. So anyway, getting into this portion here, when you enable your home switches in your input section of PNC Conf, you get these options to light up for your search velocity, search direction, latch velocity, latch direction, final velocity, um, and what these do are they let you set the direction and the feed rate to latch against 
the home switches that you have set up. So the search velocity is the fast search. The latch velocity is a slower search. And then if you wanted to set a really, really fine final velocity, you have the option, but it's not absolutely necessary. The ones that are necessary would be the search velocity for your rough home position search and the latch velocity for the final home position um, to make sure that when you back away or feed back inward towards the switch, the slower the speed, the more accurate it's going to find that position. But getting back up to here, the positive travel distance and negative travel distance in the X direction are the extents in which your machine table will move. In the case of home switches, it's the amount that the table will move from where it finds its home position. If you don't have home switches attached, what these are is they will be your limits to where the machine is powered up. So if you power the machine up in the middle of your stroke range in X, Y, and Z, then you'll have eight inches of positive travel, but you won't have any in negative. So what you'll need to do in the case of not having home switches is use a common reference return point Every time you power on and power off your machine, always return to that, that constant position. That way, when you power your machine back up, the soft limit over travel distances will work for you. Because if you, again, if you start your machine in an arbitrary position, these limits will be based off of where you enabled the machine if you don't have switches for your zero returns. So again, what these are is maximum travel limit in the X positive direction, max travel limit in the negative direction. The final home position location, what this does is it lets you offset your final position from your zero origin. So when you find your home position, the machine will move to wherever you tell it to go for the final home position location. So when it touches, it zeroes, and then the machine will move to a designated spot. And then the home switch location, which is offset from machine zero origin, what this will do is when you touch, you can tell it to zero the machine at say, you know, zero, the, the zero the machine and then move the machine 10 inches. Or you can say that the home switch location is minus 10 inches from where your actual machine origin is located. And Chris, if you're watching this, if I got that wrong, please feel free to correct me and, <laughs> and I will, uh, I'll make a note of that. The home search velocity, again, is your rough search velocity in inches per minute or in millimeters per minute, depending on your machine units. So it's basically how fast you want to look for your home switch. In the case of my router, I think I have mine set up to search at 50 inches a minute, but then when it does the fine feed, it touches the switch at 50 inches a minute it backs away and then it searches at two inches a minute to find its final latch velocity and or its final location based on the latch velocity. The home switch search direction, you can say towards negative limit or towards positive limit. So with this drop down menu, you can choose to search for your home switch in the negative direction or the positive direction, depending on where your home switch is located. So on my, on my router table, my X position switch is in the negative direction. My Y switch location is in the negative direction, but my Z switch is in the positive direction. On my 
lathe, my X position is in the positive direction and my Z is in the negative. So I would just change it right here depending on which way I have to move my machine to search for that home switch. Once the search has been achieved, it goes then into the latch velocity speed. And then you have the option for latch direction. So you can feed in the same direction or you can feed opposite. And the difference between those two is that if we have this set up in the negative limit direction and we have it set to same here, what this will do is the machine will search in the negative direction for the switch, it'll back away, and then it'll search again in the negative direction for the switch to latch again. If you have it set up to opposite, it will rough feed in the negative direction, latch the switch, and then feed in the positive direction until the switch is no longer being triggered. And then again, the final home velocity is just, if you want to fine feed this even more, you have the option of setting up a third feed rate for the final velocity. The use encoder index for home, this allows you to have two switches, a mechanical switch and a uh, proximity sensor or some type of encoder on your motor. So again, going back to my MCO, my MCO has a mechanical home sensor, but it also has an encoder wheel that's being triggered with a one pulse per revolution encoder that's being picked up by a PMP proximity sensor. If I had a closed loop stepper or a closed loop stepper or a closed loop servo system, I could use an encoder pulse on the feedback to actually set the home position. So what the so what it'll really do is it will it would search in the it would search for the mechanical switch in the fast rate it will latch against the encoder pulse with the slower latch and final velocities. I, um, I tried to do this last week and I didn't really have the greatest of luck with that. So I still have to kind of work the bugs out on that. But again, we're, we're only focusing on bare bones, but it's just things that you will use in the future. They will be confusing at first, but work on the basics, get your soft limits, get your home searching set up properly, and then from there you can build on. Same thing goes with backlash compensation. We have the ability to use uh, backlash compensation. If you want to use backlash compensation, you can set up a compensation file or you can just put in the amount of backlash compensation that you're going to need. But when you're first setting up your machine, don't worry about this kind of stuff. Just get your configuration going, save the file, and then when you want to go back in and make your changes, make your changes in PNC Conf to get your machine as close as you can to how you want your setup to actually be. That way, when you start making modifications in the future and you really booger something up, and chances are you may, because I've done it a handful of times, if you really booger something up and you feel like you've gotten to the point where you just have no recollection of how to get back to a happy machine, you can just rerun through your PNC conf and get back to your working stat, your, your working state. So moving on to y-axis and z-axis, it's just more of the same. You go in, you calculate your scale. If you're using the same micro-stepping settings and screw settings, you really don't have to worry much about this stuff here. 
You would just put in all the same information. If uh, your X, Y, and Z screws vary, or if you're using, not that you would, but if you're mix, mixing and matching your motors and drives and whatnot, and things do, you know, if, they, if they're different, you can make your adjustments here. For each individual axis, then you have your home search velocities and your soft limits and things like that for your Y axis. You get into your Z axis, it's again, more of the same. And you can see right here, positive travel distance is a maximum position of zero um, machine origin. And then negative travel distance, in my case, on my router, it's negative six. On my mini mill, it's negative 20 something. It's a pretty, uh, pretty tall Z axis. Um, we'd say, we could say negative 14 and, and have it cap to where you'll never run the spindle into the table. But if you have the column travel, you know, you can set this to where you're pretty much rubbing surface to surface if you really wanted to. On my router, minus six inches, anything past that, my bearings start running off of my rail. So I have to make sure that I home my machine in the same location. And then I search, you know, my, my soft limit is set up to where I don't ride off of my rail. So you have to be careful with that, you know, because mechanically you can't just say I've got a negative 12 when you only have a six inch Z axis because, you know, things can start to break apart on you very quickly. So getting into the spindle motor settings, depending on how you have your spindle set up on your previous pages, it depends on how this page is going to look. So if you don't have the spindle output set up, you won't see these PID settings and you won't see this output voltage information. Um, if you have a uh, step-based spindle, like I have a servo spindle on my mini mill, I have that uh, using a step gen as my spindle uh, command. But if we change go here, change our spindle output to unused, and then go back to our connectors and connector number four. I can say spindle step gen. Get back to the spindle. You can see here, instead of getting the voltage type, I have a stepper info with the same stepper driver settings that I would have for a stepper motor. And then under here, I would calculate my spindle based on steps per revolution. If I'm using uh, reduction ratios for my uh, different spindle speeds, things like that. But if we go back and change that again to unused step gen, and then analog spindle, we'll get the voltage information to use for our spindle setting. And then under calculate scale, you'd still get a similar menu, but instead of steps per revolution, you'll get a motor voltage or a motor uh, RPM at 10 volt command. And if you have multiple speeds you can set up for the, uh, you could set up your pulley ratios, you could set up your maximum RPM in ratio number one, and then set up max RPM in ratio number two. And then you would set up, if you're using an encoder, you would set up an encoder scale and so on and so forth. So it can get pretty it can get pretty involved. So my suggestion to you is if you are setting up a router and you're not 
using anything from here to command your spindle. If you have a VFD that's got a potentiometer on the front, use that. You know, get, get started with that. Use a potentiometer. When you get to a point where you feel comfortable with it, then you can try to use the analog output from the Mesa card or whatever and connect that to the potentiometer pins on the VFD and you can override your potentiometer potentially. No pun intended. On, the, uh, on my router I have a super PID and the super PID came with a potentiometer on it and I removed the potentiometer and I used the three lugs for uh, I used the three lugs to connect the uh, PWM signal off of my G540 and that seems to work fine. You know, and again, it, it's the the more you the more you learn about this stuff, the easier it becomes. So you will have to tinker a little bit. And it doesn't it this isn't just specific to Linux CNC. This is for any system that you're building, be it Linux based or mock base or centroid or maso or whatever you will have to learn some of this stuff and it's gonna you know, it sometimes it can take a little while but don't let that get you down because the more you do it the more you learn about it and the more you learn about it the easier it becomes so yeah you're looking at a bare bones tutorial right now but as we all improve and we need to learn more about the stuff. We can share information amongst ourselves, or you can come back in, you know, however many months, and you can watch advanced tutorials when I, when I learn the stuff and get around to, you know, showing you guys how to do it. So I mean, we're all, we're all trying to uh, reach common goals, and we're all trying to, we're all trying to make our machines the best we can. So moving into this, we do have an option setting page where we can uh, include HAL UI user interface components and commands and we can pop in a couple of commands that we want to have the machine utilize but again we don't have to it's just an option we can include links to classic ladder PLC so you can watch my classic ladder videos and learn how to set up I.O. chains with PLC logic. But again, you don't have to. You can add additional HAL components inside of here. You can add MUX scales. You can add low-pass filters. You can add PIDs. You can add all kinds of stuff inside of here. But you don't necessarily have to. This is all optional stuff. Once you get to the almost done page, hit OK, and it will create your machine file and your configuration. You hit yes, and then inside of your desktop here, and also in your Linux CNC configuration, test mill PNC, hit OK, and we get this error message. Why do we get this error message? Because I'm not tied to a 7i76e at the moment. So the first thing Linux CNC is going to try to do when I want to launch my machine is it's going to look for the physical hardware. Whenever you see this error box pop up, the most useful bit of information is towards the bottom, underneath your debug file information. This right here and a couple of lines right above it are going to be exactly what the software is looking for that it can't find that made it crap out and give you this error report. This is the this is the most important portion of all this information. So right now I can see error could not retrieve hardware address couldn't find the IP, and then from there, resource temporarily unavailable. Sometimes you'll get this if you try to start your software 
a little too quickly. So if you fire up your computer, your computer fires up, you turn on your machine before it has a chance to communicate with the Mesa card and you try to load your software, you may get this. And then you close it out and you reload it and it'll pop up for you. So if you are trying to build a machine and follow along with this without being connected to the physical hardware, you may experience this, but don't fret, connect your board and everything will run fine. So I hope this was helpful for anybody trying to get through the PNC Comp Wizard. Um, there is still a lot to cover in PNC Comp. It is a very powerful wizard. And you know, be that as it may, there, there's going to be times where you will have to enter your configuration files and, and add things that PNC Conf does not offer. So to do that, you'll get into this little file folder right here is a shortcut to the configuration for this test mill PNC. So inside of the configuration folder shortcut, the PNC Conf Wizard will give you all of these files that you'll need in the future to make changes to your machine setup in ways that the wizards do not let you. And again, don't be afraid of this. This is all being broken down in my how tutorials. This is just showing you the location of where these files are. So when you need to make changes to your how configurations and PNC Conf doesn't give you exactly what you're looking for, you would just double click on your folder, go into your configurations and you can start making changes to your how. And your HAL is your hardware abstraction layer, which lets you link physical inputs and outputs to the Linux CNC software. And it also lets you communicate back and forth with Classic Ladder and things like that. So if you are interested in modifying HAL files and creating Classic Ladder PLCs and things like that, just follow along with the tutorials in my other playlists, I do have a breakdown of basic HAL and basic classic ladder. If you look at those playlists, just follow along with those. If you create a simulated, um, simulated hardware environment in StepConf Wizard, you can follow along with those tutorials and you can make changes to your HAL files in the simulations. So if you really booger something up, all you got to do is just, again, open up StepConf Wizard blow through the configuration again, hit OK, and everything resets back to where your simulation works again. So if you get into the habit of practicing on simulation files, you don't have to worry about your machine files getting messed up because you're just playing around with simulated hardware. So that's going to conclude my PNC Conf Wizard tutorial. Uh, please be sure to like and subscribe. And again, if you uh, have any suggestions for the future, please let me know and I will try to get to it in a future video. Thanks for watching.